Hi, I'm Katya. And I'm Rin. And we're here at the Commonwealth Center at Holistic Herbalism in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm Rebecca Altman coming to you from Idlewild, California. And we're all on the internet everywhere, thanks to the power of the podcast. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> So um, this is our lovely friend, Rebecca. And Rebecca also teaches awesome herby goodness. And to be honest, makes the best herbal products on the planet. And you can't get them anymore because she has recently changed her, her focus of her work. And that's actually what we're going to talk about today. So um, Rebecca started teaching this amazing class called the wonder sessions or course i guess it's not one class it's like a whole series and we can talk about that a little bit more in a minute but as we were having a conversation about it uh she made some comment that was sort of like um oh and now this is kind of more herbalism adjacent because though this this course really focuses on building self-awareness and things that one of our mentors, Paul Bergner, would call self-mastery, like really knowing yourself deeply and, and being aware of how you are uh, in the world. She will say it better than that, but for the purpose of this introduction, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, were, we were talking and I was like, that is not adjacent to herbalism in my mind, that is like the primary work of herbalism. That is, that is the like, do not pass go, do not collect any plants, like <laughs> part of the herbal journey. And so that's what we wanted to talk about today. Yeah, so Rebecca, maybe you could um, talk a little bit about that transition. What drove you to that? About the transition. Um, the course itself had been brewing in like it had been percolating there in the back of my mind for a very long time and I think I had probably wanted to start teaching it about five years before I actually did and I'm actually so glad I didn't five years before because I was so in no way ready to teach this course <laughs> <laughs> five years before I wanted to and um that sort of actually brings up another an, an interesting point to me about percolation time and how long some things actually take to get to the point where they're ready. Yeah. But it was, um, I'm going to be completely honest about this. It started off as one thing and I had originally envisioned it as like a year long course that guides people into deeper connection with the natural world. And I launched the course. A lot of people signed up. <laughs> and then I started writing the course. Um, <laughs> and it was the kind of thing that if, if I had waited until it was done before launching it, I would never have written it. So I was just like, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I was just like, fuck it. I'm doing it because I'm, I'm doing it. And I wasn't A, expecting as many people to sign up and B, I had such a clear idea of where it was going. And then when I started writing it, I was like, oh, this isn't, <laughs> like it's not coming out the way I thought it was going to come out at all. And um, it was like, I had agreed <laughs> with like, the natural world around me to express this thing and my brain had thought it was going to be one thing and as it started coming out I was like oh shit first of all this isn't a year-long course <laughs> second like there are some things that I need to face in myself before I can even express this and so the first six months or so of writing this course turned into like me going through the gauntlet of my own life and like you think you can teach this ha ha let's see how you feel about it really you think you can teach this oh here's a nice test for you it's like mm. <laughs> you want pain we'll give you pain <laughs> and, like, and, and so it was um yeah it it turned into this thing that I had no idea that it was going to become and we are now um it's been two years, I'm about to launch it for the third year, and I still 
don't fully know how to describe it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all I know is that it is now a two year journey that sort of guides people on an internal journey into discovering um, their own ability to receive and feel joy and feel connection with the natural world and connection with other people and to let the world in. Mm. But also an internal journey to sort of like clear out all of the things that get in the way of us seeing how alive the world around us is and how we are such a deeply connected part of it. Like it's not us and nature it, and it doesn't matter where we are. It's like we are a part of nature and a part of the growing natural world. And that's as apparent in a big city as it is when you're out in the wilderness. And it's like, like a city to me is such a, an amazing expression of wildness that um, I love it so much. And so it's like this thing where it's sort of like weaving um, our place back into the fabric of nature mm. in a way so that we are a part of it. And that is a long journey because it involves undoing all of the societal programming that we've had our whole lives that make us feel separate from it and superior to it and in control of it and in control of ourselves and in control of our own lives and like we have any clue or understanding of the big picture so it's this big thing and um for the first two years i was doing that and writing it and teaching it at the same time as i was making products and shipping products and marketing products and doing all this stuff and it was a lot of work <laughs> It was a lot of work. And when um, my husband and I moved up here to Idlewild, we were living in Los Angeles for 10 years. And we moved up here just over a year ago. And I found the perfect little shop space to keep manufacturing my products. And everything was perfect on the surface. And then I started hitting like roadblocks left and right, where I was like, I couldn't find help. And I needed help desperately and then like we had five feet of snow for so long and I couldn't get to the post office and people were like where the hell is my order and I'm like I can't mm. there. I'm sorry like we don't have mail delivery right now and then we had floods and lost all of our roads and then we had like a fire and we're evacuated it was it was so much that um after a while I was just like either I get my super stubborn Scorpio hat on and like double down on this that's a that's a, that's the right use usage of double down okay cool. yeah yeah it is, i'm not <laughs> I, say, I say the wrong idiom all the time um, <laughs> and uh or i just let it go and focus on the thing that i actually want to be doing full-time which is teaching and spending time with my students and writing and like because that really has been what i've been wanting to do for so long and i was like it's time. Um, so. Rebecca, I wonder if maybe, uh, <laughs> so, so that was like, you, there was a thing that was, that you were doing, you were trying to do a bunch of stuff, you realized that you couldn't do both, and then you said, okay, time to change. But I think maybe it didn't quite happen like that. I think maybe that there was like a long period of, uh, like, wrestling with that decision. Is that true? Or did it really turn around fast? It might be that the wrestling happened before the decision. The wrestling happened before the decision. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just a personality trait of mine that yeah. once the decision is made, there's no more wrestling. Okay. However, I think for a few years, I had been wondering if I wanted to be making products forever. Mm. And I think there's a thing that happens when you're good at something where you feel like, but this is what I should be doing. Yeah. Uh, and when you're successful at something there's also like why would you how could you give this up, mm -hmm. you give up something that's doing well that's like um and and i remember maybe it was when i started writing the wonder sessions and i said to my husband that like my dream would be to write full time and to be teaching full time and like having this group of students and we're so close. And so it's just so beautiful, like our interactions. 
And I said, yeah, that, that's my dream to have that full time. But I was like, you know, financially, I don't know if I'll ever get to that place. So, mm. um, and then, so I think it had been in the back of my mind that like I had been wanting to make that transition. And then when all of these roadblocks came up and my husband was like, you know what you said you wanted to be doing full time. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think the, the biggest part of the struggle for me was that I'd found the perfect place and I had set it up to be like the perfect manufacturing space. So it's like, I had a six foot giant manufacturing table and a sink and like everything was like, it was very well organized. <laughs> Not a very well organized space. Um, and so that was hard for me, I think, because I, I do tend to place a lot of meaning in things in life. And so I'd say, but why would I find a perfect place? And if it was only meant to be my perfect place for a year and to have so much struggle as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that was my biggest mental thing to get around. And then I was actually chatting to a friend of mine and she was like, but you would have had in the back of your mind, like what could have happened? Cause I've always like had this, I want a shop space. I want a shop space. I want a shop space. So quitting before trying it meant I would have always been questioning. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think that sometimes you just need to try something to know you don't want it. And yeah. that came clear very quickly. And if it hadn't been the perfect place, I, it would have always been there yeah. like, but it wasn't the perfect place. So maybe if I'd had the perfect place, yeah, um, it's sort of like, I don't know, it's, it's like any kind of relationship where you, if you don't try everything, then you don't know for sure. And yeah. then you've always got like lingering tendrils. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, I tried everything and I was like, no, this is good. And ending on a note before I got resentful, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Pretty great when you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But also I think sometimes like it's hard to kill your, I was about to say babies, but that doesn't sound right. Uh, darlings, people. Darlings, there we go. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's something that you have like grown and nurtured and you know, it was a thing that didn't exist before, before, and now it does. And you put all the energy into it and then being able to say, it's time to stop now. Mm -hmm. That's a thing. It's a thing. It, there's something really, um, exciting and nerve wracking and empowering and devastating about it all at once. It's, it's pretty great. I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I was, I was really interested by what you said about having, uh, having made up made the idea for the course and then uh marketed it and got a bunch of people enrolled and then sitting down to write it because that idea gives me hives and <laughs> I do that all the time mm -hmm. and it gives me hives all the time the <laughs> idea that it's like but we haven't actually made the entire thing and completed it and gotten all of the supplementary materials into there as well before we sell it to anybody and katya is often like we just have to keep moving Let's just go. Well, you know, we had a similar experience also because I wanted to start our online program three full years before I could convince him that we really should do it. And, yeah. and I too am glad that we didn't do it before we did it because a lot of things grew in those three years that, that really me meant that when we actually launched it, it was perfect. Like, Okay, maybe not perfect because there's definitely <laughs> things I want to add already. But it was like it was it was really ready for this format um, in a way that it hadn't. It would have been fine if we had done it three years earlier, but it wouldn't have been awesome. Yeah, and this is awesome. I That's think awesome. we think it's pretty. I good. feel thrilled. Yeah. I I feel thrilled <laughs> with the work that we're doing. Yeah. Right. And that's where the awesome is. Like I hope that the people who receive it also are very thrilled with it. But but like. I feel thrilled with it. I want to be doing it. I, I am excited about everything that goes into it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But the, just the idea of like, you have to already be doing the thing before you can know fully whether it's actually the right thing. That's, that's scary sometimes. Yeah. Right? 
Yeah. Uh, but it does seem to be true over and over again. Yeah. 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 It's true. It's really, um, it's vulnerable. And because people are paying you for it as well, there's an element of responsibility there that is, um, it's, it's a great responsibility. Yeah. And, and so that is, yeah, that, that's a huge thing. There's a lot of pressure there. And it, I, I think, um, I think temperament wise, had I not had such like a choleric streak that makes me, um, like, Ooh, pressure. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> I will rise to this. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I, I could see that like different temperaments would either like thrive or collapse under that, just depending. But I think also in, there's the reality of this world that we live in where we don't all have the luxury of the time to write something before marketing it. And I've spoken to a few different herbalists about this and they're like, you know, I've never written a course before selling it because just financially I like literally couldn't do that. And there's, I think this is something that's really um, important to take into account. Like, you know, in an ideal world, of course, Right. I think that most of us would want to, you know, spend 10 years getting something to the point where we're actually able to put it out into the world and then, um, and then have people want to <laughs> sign up for it or read it or whatever it is that we're doing, but we don't sort of live in a, I'll say artist supportive world. Cause I think that there is an element of artistry yeah. to whatever it is that we're doing. Um, it just, it doesn't work like that. Um, which I've, do either of you watch Grand Designs? No. I don't know that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, on Netflix, it's a British TV show where um, they follow people building their own houses, basically. Um, the reason I bring it up is that I saw two episodes back to back, and one was an engineer who had drawn up all of his designs for the house so specifically that the house was made like and it was perfect and it was beautiful because it was built in a Fibonacci spiral and it was like it was a like an amazing house and um and I thought wow that's such a good example of a choleric expression of something and moving forward unrestricted it was beautiful and then immediately after that I watched one where it was a melancholic man who built a house for his family and refused to use any materials that he hadn't found on his own land. And he did everything by hand, like to the point where like posts, he would like hand carve the, whatever you call them that go around the top of the posts. He like handmade all of the doors. He handmade all of the um, hinges that held the doors on with wood. It took him 10 years to build this house. And it was like, by the time they show back up, like the show took 10 years, the guy kept going back, the presenter kept going back every year and being like, are you done yet? And he's like, no, but we just put in a window. <laughs> and his wife and kids were all living in like, um, like a little one room house on the property basically that he thought it was going to take one year. And so they're like, this is fine. We'll live in this house for a year. And it ended up being 10 years. The kids were teenagers by the point. He was done. And, um, and I remember like the presenter asked his wife, like, how do you feel about this? She's like, I trust him. It's going to get done and it's going to be perfect. And I was just like, that to me was this perfect example of what we don't have as a society, which is space for artists to create according to their vision. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was, I mean, like it moved me to the point where I'm still talking about it a year after watching it and still like have you seen grand designs <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's really interesting to me about that though is especially as it relates to the work that we're doing um that we all of us are doing is that the melancholic guy who built his house over 10 years he had to have had a lot of skills to intricately carve things and to be able to make his own hinges. And maybe there were some things that he didn't know how to do when he started and he learned along the way. 
but clearly there were a lot of things that he already had the skill to do. Mm -hmm. And so the work was the journey. The production of the home was the journey, but he had prepared himself for that journey. Even though the journey took 10 years, he was fully prepared. He had the tools. Mm -hmm. He had the skill of using the tools. He knew where the materials were coming from. He had sourced the materials, right? Mm -hmm. Even if maybe he hadn't harvested them all yet, he had sourced them. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of parallel in that because when we talk about like that we have things that we teach that maybe we haven't written yet, um, when it's straight up herbalism, I mean, Rin and I have been teaching for 10 years and now we're putting that material online. And of course, as we do it, we're rewriting it because we're like, oh, this could be better. That could be better. This oh, some updates. we have some time. <laughs> we have extra time so we can add in these other things that we can't do when we're in person because we run out of time every time. But, but all that skill set is still there. And I think that's true on your side too, yeah. that, that you, this is not the first time you're doing this work. Like your whole life has been about rounds and rounds and rounds of this kind of processing work. Mm -hmm. So you have the tools, you have the materials and, and what people are trusting you to do is to assemble them in a way to create a journey for them. And that is a journey for you, but you're walking into the situation with the integrity of your skills, even if creating the end product means that you ha have to go through several more rounds with those skills. Can I just say, whoa, <laughs> your ability to like do that. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well, <thank you. laughs> um, yes, totally. And I feel like there's, um, you know that that phrase when you teach you learn twice yeah. yes i think it also has to do with that like you know this stuff and then when you go to actually put it out into the world in a way that is um like not just repackaging it but like combining it with other things it's like we we learn one thing and then another thing and then we we sort of combine points in a way that is going to make sense to the people who are called to be our students in a way that speaks to them but it's like in order to combine all these things that we learn it's like you do have to in a way learn it again yeah, yeah. or being able to express it and i think there's there's something to that as well like in order to be able to teach something like you don't just need to know it but you need to have embodied it in a way that makes it easy to communicate which is so different to just knowing something yeah like in order in order to teach something, you have to learn it, and then you need to live it. But in order to do that, you kind of have to unravel it because the way that you receive it is the language and the, and the methodology of the person who gave it to you. Then you have to unravel the whole thing, put it into your own language, not just your spoken language, but your body language, your life language, and then live it, but, and you think, great, I can say it now because I've really synthesized all of that into my life. And then you start talking and you realize, <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> but if all you do is pass it on in your life language, now, it, yes, right. yeah, so you're like passing on something that's synthesized and no matter how well you create something to pass on, then your students still will have to break it all down, synthesize it into something that becomes their life language. Right. Yeah. For us, um, I think for a long time, but it feels more acute lately, um, we've been thinking a lot about ways to emphasize for our students that they need to do that work too, yeah. right? Especially the ones who want to go into practice as herbalists or, or even like whatever, whatever they're going to do with the knowledge, they, they can't just get it from us and have it. They need to, yes. <laughs> they need to like, encounter it uh, in like the full depth of, of what that word could mean to encounter something. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and they need, to, they need to work through it and move through it and see what comes from that. And totally. it might not look anything like what we do with it. Totally, especially with herbalism. Yeah. I feel 
feel like our field is, it's like this, it's this living being that you step inside <laughs> and, um, or maybe step onto its shoulders or something. Maybe it's just like you're hitching a ride on the back of an ant. And, um, and so if, if in herbalism you just regurgitate what you learn from your teacher, then you're not really stepping inside it at all. Mm -mm. Because I, I think we are lucky enough to have chosen this path, but to me it's so much more than just like information about plants. And I think for most of us, it's so much more than information about plants. It's about connection and it's about ourselves and it's about healing. And it's about this, um, this deep societal wound that has fucked up the planet for so long. Like there's so many nuances to, to this field that we're a part of and this community that we're a part of. And so I think it's really, um, it's an incredible living being that yes we each have our own little i think it's a, a living being that expands um based on whoever joins it and so everyone who joins it is going to feel like i want to learn from that person i want to learn from that person i want to learn from that person and that person and that person and all of a sudden their own section of this beast emerges wow. and it's um it's this growing thing so so now we're to self-mastery Right. And, and as you were talking, I was thinking like, great. Once you learn all about herbalism, uh, you're not ready yet. You need to go get sick. Right. <laughs> like, because say that to people. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't ever, like one of our students, um, in the community herbalist program this year got mono really bad in the middle of the year. And it was amazing because she had to, I mean, it's really inconvenient to get mono as an adult, like when you have to go to work and stuff, except you can't. Yeah. And, and so her, like her need to synthesize what she was learning was enormous and her relationship with the material changed drastically because mm. of that illness. And so I kind of feel like if you're a person who's never been sick as an herbalist, like some people are like, well, you're an herbalist. Why do you get sick? No, no, you've got to get sick. Or like you never have a chance to, to do this work. And, and that's true on one hand, but there's the other part of it that is the, the self-awareness, the, the internal work. And we don't have to get sick to do that because we all already have it. Like our society is already so deep with schism from nature that uh, we already have, we all already carry that sickness and it's that work that is the other side of the sniffly nose, you know, or the, whatever, the creaky joints, whatever the physiology, whatever is. it is. Yeah. There's, it's an interesting thing that, um, I, I'm like a, a nebulous thought person. I don't know if you knew this already. <laughs> <laughs> we, we noticed that about you. <laughs> Um, there's, so there's, there's like, I live in Southern California, which is the land of like bright eyed, bushy tailed, I have limitless energy and unstoppable sex drive and I'm super successful mm -hmm. and, um, I've manifested everything I want in my own life and this is my life is so perfect and I sell these supplements. <laughs> which is basically how I got here. Um, and there's this um, veneer of perfection that a lot of people strive for. Mm. And it is, I think so many people feel like the path, whatever the path is, is the path to escape suffering um, or to escape the possibility of anything bad ever happening in yeah. your life. And so when you see your teachers um, who are human and experience vulnerability, when you see them experiencing that, it can make some people be like, what? But I thought I was getting out of this. <laughs> um, 
And I think that is exacerbated by this perfection veneer society where people reach a certain point and, um, and start hiding their struggles. And um, a friend of mine, she's a yoga teacher, her name's Angela Jameson, and she wrote an amazing, amazing article. And she was talking about yoga, but I think it applies everywhere. And her article was about celebrity versus relationship. And she said, we live in a celebrity culture where we want to put people on pedestals and look up to them and be just like them. And there is no vulnerability there. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, when you put someone on a pedestal, they will fall. Yes. And it creates this, this power dynamic where you're like, I have nothing and you have everything and I want to be just like you. And it's this terrible thing that we all do. We don't all do, but it's a very common thing in society that people do in order to avoid the messiness of relationship and the, the vulnerability and the stickiness and the ugh, all of that stuff. But it's so isolating. Um, and like on both sides actually yeah it's isolating to be a teacher and to have that done to you yeah and it's isolating to be a student and to to do that to yourself you know to be like oh i'm you know i will never be like that right and and it does set up a situation where where there's a lot of fear to be vulnerable but also there's so much need to emph- i mean it's why i talk about cake all the time like it's a dumb thing but yeah. no i mean i think one of the um if i could get people to listen to one thing that we've ever made it would be this podcast episode we we had called how to not be a guru um yeah. <laughs> because we think that that's yeah. important and it's yeah. to actively work to a- achieve as any kind of a teacher but even more so when the things that you're teaching do have to do with um, improving people's health or mm-hmm. helping them to, you know, achieve more self mastery or more, more self awareness or something like that. So I'm sure this is something that you must deal with a lot, um, uh, is like students getting the coming, maybe coming in with the idea that you're going to solve all their problems for them by teaching them your secret skills and that then they're not going to have these problems anymore. And now they can just do what Rebecca says and everything will be fine. Do you have that? Like you can self-master yourself out of suffering. You can self-master yourself out of suffering. Wouldn't that be amazing? (laughs) Um, I don't, hang on. I want to see if I'm like trying to avoid noticing something because it's uncomfortable. I don't know if I've had that yet, but I think I make such a big effort from the very beginning to be like, hey, I am human. And I think I've in a way been kind of lucky that, um, not lucky that I screwed up so much, but um, I've been so honest about like, hey, I thought this course was gonna be one thing and it's not, and I'm so sorry because like, so so I sort of started on this very human note where I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I am being guided by something else here. And like, I've sort of tried to make very clear um, from the very beginning that it is nothing to do with me. Like I'm more like a conduit for information and I happen to have been through some shit. So I'm quite good at helping other people through their own shit, um, <laughs> but not through giving them advice, but just being like, I am here and you are okay and you can feel this. Um, and when you feel this, you will know what to do and sort of like handing it right back over mm. um, because I have no desire to be the person responsible for another person's journey. Like that's messy and gross and- And it doesn't serve them anyway. No, right? that's like-, like- at that point, it's just like, it's just like healthcare, like in the, in the state, every state in the United States regulates um, the definition of medicine, the practice of medicine a little bit differently. But in Massachusetts, the legal definition of the practice of medicine actually includes the words. Uh, yeah, it's, it's to assume responsibility for the maintenance of human health by the, um, by, by encouraging their reliance upon the doctor's knowledge and skill. Right? Yeah. Isn't that gross? Yeah. Oh. And 
I have met chiropractors who do that. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's what our culture says is that you should rely on a doctor to tell you what's wrong with you, that you should rely on a doctor to make you healthy. And I'm not saying that there's, I mean, obviously there's a huge place for conventional medicine and there's so much stuff that they do that's really important, but I need to rely on myself. Yeah. And I want practitioners who help me to rely on myself, who help me to, who give me the tools that I need, whatever kind of practitioner it is. I want someone to give me the tools that I need to be self-reliant, yes. not to encourage me to be reliant on them. And especially when you're doing work in self-awareness, you can't, you can't become self-aware if you're relying on somebody else for the no. journey. You no, have. and it's this... It's this, this strange thing. I think such a huge part of the societal wound has to do with disempowerment in the first yeah. place. And um, we learn from such a young age to hand over our free will and to listen to adults. And even if it's, you know, even if we don't um, agree, we're supposed to just like toe the line and do what we're told. And so we, we learn to do this. Mm -hmm. um, don't even get me started on school. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and so it it's a it's an interesting thing where a, a lot of people have a really really hard time with it because it feels like it, it's like it goes against people's deepest survival mechanisms to um, start to stand in their own power yeah. and so it is it's something I have a lot of compassion for because it's something that I've struggled with as well. And so it's not, I, I recognize that it's not always easy for people to just sort of be like, okay, I know my own answers now, but I think it's so beautiful to see people go on that journey and start to discover that they have their own answers, or even if they don't have their own answers, that they're comfortable with not having answers. Mm. So, you know, given that this is something that people aren't really trained to do in our culture, um, how do you, how do you teach them to do it? How, where do you start? Well, I have a course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> not saying give away your secrets here, obviously, but. <laughs> uh, no, I'm saying you can sign up for the wonder sessions. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. You I mean, should. I'm not kidding, but also, but also, <laughs> but also, yeah, yeah. um, where to start? I'm going to take a minute to organize my thoughts before I just start talking. Mm -hmm. I actually, I have a few thoughts on this too, and I don't want to talk because I want to give you space to think, but I'm also very excited. <laughs> talk. <laughs> <laughs> so this is work that Again, we're coming back to like the physiological and the the other part. They're not other parts. They're the same part, but whatever. Because it is the same work whether you're learning to stand in your own power and hold your own integrity and authority for emotional health, like for self-awareness. It's the same skill to stand in your own power for your physical health. And it's scary. It's really scary because as soon as you say, yes, I do take responsibility for my own health. Now, if you're sick, like there's nobody but you. And that isn't ever true because there's always other people. Like taking responsibility doesn't mean that you can't ask for help. It just means that, that um, you know, you have to notice that you're eating Oreos and is that okay for you right now? Like you have to make those decisions or whatever that's, the idea that came to my mind because I'm always thinking about sugary treats. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yum. Um, and so uh, that work, that, that fear of like, how do I decide if it's safe for me to take care of myself or if I need to go get help? How do I decide if when I go and ask for help, I agree with what they said? How do I sit in consultation with a practitioner, whatever kind of practitioner it is, and make good choices about, do I think that what they're recommending is right for me and my body right now? And that it takes practice. It takes practice and, and 
And also, so it takes practice to say, I'm not certain that I know the right answer, but I see where I would like to go and I'm going to try it. And then also it takes practice to take the risk to try it yeah. and to, and to like break down the community or the like social construct that we have, that you have to know the right answer before you try something <sighs> that instead the only thing there ever is, is trying something and then finding out afterwards if it was right or not. And if it wasn't right, that might mean that there's more suffering than there would have been if you had tried something else first. And that's the, that is it. Is it that's the responsibility, is taking responsibility for, yeah, I might pick the wrong thing. Yeah. I might get tons of education from lots of practitioners, and then the choice might come down to me, and I might pick the wrong choice, and that's okay. To develop on that. You know the thing that happens when a person is traumatized where play goes out the window mm. and life becomes about survival. And when life is about survival, making the right choice is really important because yeah. it has to do with life or death. So what if, as a society in general, we are actually traumatized by the way society is structured? And because it is not set up for <laughs> any of us to exist in a way that is um, supportive to our um, deeper, wilder natures. And, you know, some of us more than others, some of us less than others, but society isn't set up for any of us really to thrive. So what if we're all in some way or another traumatized and therefore we all sort of have this idea that we need to get it right because it does feel like survival. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I believe and see in people is in returning to a state of trust and being able to explore a little it is not only really really nice because it makes fun um, of life and you know it there's definitely something to being able to be in this state of like exploration and curiosity even when it has to do with suffering or pain or physical sensations or emotional things going on to just be like, oh, this is curious. Um, I'm interested in this. And, um, but that getting to that place means a sort of, it's like a simultaneous healing of the societal traumas inflicted on us, <laughs> inflicted on us or by us to each other or whatever. Um, and that I think that space is the space that we sort of need to move forwards from. And it is a leap into the unknown because it does mean trusting life and trusting that you're gonna be okay and trusting that you have the reserves to handle things, but it makes such a big difference when it comes to trying things because you're no longer trying something with the need for it to be right first time, um, but you're trying something with the, let's see how this goes. And um, it's such a different approach. And it's like, it's like children, right? Like children don't think about whether or not they're resilient. They know they are. And so if they fall down, they, they scrape their knee, they whatever, it's sad for a minute and they go on. But we get into this place where we have to get it right. We, we feel like there isn't this, we don't have the resilience. We do, we, but do. we don't trust that we do. And we don't feel it physiologically. We don't feel the resilience sometimes because we're so depleted by stress and by chronic crud. Um, that would be the technical term. Yes. That, uh, that we genuinely don't feel that our bodies have that resilience and we don't know how to rebuild it. 
but then also we don't believe that we have the resilience to experiment because like even from everyday stress and everything else like emotionally we don't have those reserves either and the thing is that doing that experimentation is what builds the resilience but it's scary to try it because you think i need resilience to try because what if it doesn't work but trying it is what will get you resilience and it's like ah <laughs> Yeah. And the only answer to that is baby steps. Yeah. It's like you have to take a tiny step and be like, oh, I'm okay. Wow. I'm okay. And then another one. Will that like, work again? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. And that's how you build your trust muscle is through actually doing it. And I think that a lot of people have this idea that um, it has to be a giant dramatic step. Like, uh, like, <sighs> Oh, I was about to name um, a movie that would not be appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, I'm going to go to herb school. I'm going to get in my cocoon. And while I'm in my cocoon, I'm in herb school. And when I come out, I will be my beautiful transformed butterfly. And it's like, no, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess. <laughs> it's going to be a mess. Like, please be a mess. Yeah. Like, I, I think there's, it, like, it goes back to that striving for perfection thing where I, I feel like, like, we are perfect in our messiness. Yeah. It's beautiful. And this, this idea that we're always on a journey and we're always en route somewhere. And so I, you know, I, I feel like, I don't know, because I've never spoken to her, but I would guarantee that Oprah wakes up some mornings and is like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like I would guarantee it because it's human and she's a human who's constantly growing and trying new things and that's like we look at other people and we're like god they're they're not a mess and I'm oh like, they're a mess oh, yeah on the inside they're like what the hell am I doing why did I do that oh my goodness I can't believe I said that <laughs> and I'm like, there is no one who on the inside feels like they are perfect and if they do they're missing something um but, and so I think it's this, this, yeah, it's very interesting that we have been taught to compare ourselves to each other's outsides when mm -hmm. it's like that, that doesn't say anything. And it sets us up for this horrendous comparison game where we're comparing ourselves to something that isn't real. Yeah. Um, stupid. Stupid. <laughs> Students or clients will come and they'll be like, oh, you're going to be so disappointed in me because I did my whole 30 for three days and then I ate a piece of pie. And I'm like, are you kidding? You did science, this is great, you have data, this is wonderful. Or like, oh, you're gonna be disappointed because I got sick and I tried to fix it with herbs and it, I, it wasn't working and I went to the doctor. And I'm like, I'm thrilled because you made a choice to support your health in the way that felt right and best to you in that moment. Yeah. That's perfect. Like you don't lose your herbalism card just because you went to the doctor because that oh. felt like the thing that you needed to do in that moment. Right. And guess what? That is going to make you such a good practitioner because next time you say to someone, you need to do the whole 30, you're going to be like, how do I help this person do the whole 30? How can I tell someone to do this when I couldn't do it? Right. Um, like, guess who never tells someone to try food elimination diets? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I tried dairy once and it was like, I think after a month, everyone in my life was like, please stop talking to me about milk. <laughs> like, stop it. I don't care that you miss it. I don't care that you miss cheese. <laughs> That's why I tell people so much about how much I love cake, because it isn't that it's easy for me to be gluten-free, it's that it's serious for me to not be gluten-free. And so hard or not, I have to do it, which is why I have so many recipes for gluten-free cake. <laughs> really important. Yeah, it's really important. It's really like, it's, it's actually, it's impossible to succeed if you don't fill that craving spot, whatever it is, but it's not about it's easy for you or it's too hard for me. It's mm -hmm. about finding that path between like your own awareness of what you need to do and whatever tricks it takes to help you succeed with that. Yes.
totally and I, I think there's um there's this assumption and it's like I think this applies across the board like it's not just with foods um and it's not just with teaching or learning or the the path of self um development or whatever you call it <laughs> but there's this idea that when you see other people do it that it must be easy for them mm -hmm. and like i remember i had a yoga teacher who used to just do like astonishing things and and i remember i said something like oh but it's easy for you and she was like i came to this broken like i had been hit by a car and could barely move um so when you say that it's easy for me that is really um like it's, it's denying her own journey mm -hmm. and also making it seem like it is something that's out of reach for me um and there, i think there's there's something really interesting about that where we we sort of be like oh but it's easy for you i that that's not possible for me and i couldn't do that and um it's really disempowering to ourselves and that's not saying that we don't all face different struggles um but there's also like I, I i love to do this experiment of when we say i can't yes changing it to i won't yeah. or i don't want to or i want to want to um and i think that's what happens with most people is that we want to want to do things mm -hmm. we don't actually want to do things as a side note that really doesn't work um well when it comes to parties I tried that and I'm like, I want to want to come to your party. Um, and people are like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, isn't honesty good? No. <laughs> that's, that's such a cultural thing though, because why do we want to want that? Like, <laughs> we need to, how many things do we need to want? Like, hey, is it okay to not want that? Like, hey, you don't have to want all the things that society tells you are good. You can want half of them. You can want one of them. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you don't want to be good at music. It's okay. You don't have to be, you know? Yeah. Like, on the other hand, if you want to be good at music and you think, well, it's easy for them, but it's hard. Like, okay, so I've started taking Irish harp lessons and my teacher is very good and I am not, and I have a musical background, so it's doubly frustrating because it all clicks in my head, but getting it into my hands, I mean, it is literally about taking the time to develop the muscles to make my hands do this thing that is not normal for hands to do, and it is just going to take hours and hours and hours, and to say that it was easy for her, just like for that yoga teacher, negates all of the hours that she has spent doing the exact same work that I have to do, developing my muscles to do what I want them to do. And so if you want something, it doesn't have to be easy. You just have to want to spend the hours and maybe hours and hours and hours getting to a point where you can do that. And that's true whether it's harp or yoga or emotional health or anything, or being able to sit, to sit comfortably with discomfort, whatever it is, it is just, just the time it takes to train and it's not fast and our society wants fast and our society wants easy and our society wants us to be able to do all things. Yes. And none of those are, none of them are anything. Like, no. Oh. Although I will say, I'm gonna do the Kali hands thing. On the other hand, and on the other hand, and on the other hand, um, I would like to acknowledge that you and I are both very choleric. And so <laughs> we have this privilege in an already choleric society of being people who are like, I want to do that, I'm going to do that, and I'm gonna get there. Whereas for plenty of other people, there are hurdles. <laughs> that come from just not being like necessarily a forward momentum driven person yeah. in the same way. So it isn't um, like, I would like to acknowledge that it isn't 
always a case of if you want to do it, then you can do it. Um, but, right. and I think this ties back into what we were saying before about learning about yourself and learning how you work in the world and being able to trust yourself. Because for example, um, learning how you learn yeah. is really so important. Like I, for example, cannot learn sitting still to save my life. Like I hate sitting still. This has been um, hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so when I was in Chinese medical school, I would study like pacing and I would just pace or I'd put my notes and I would like start to do a yoga practice. And I would just like, I had to I'd go on a hike and just say things out loud and like find ways to get my brain hmm. to do things. And there's um, like, we all have different ways of incorporating information yeah. and different ways of getting to where we're going. And this idea that it needs to be this like straightforward linear um, get to your goal by pushing as hard as you can thing is really, um, it's harmful. Yeah. Because, because once again, like you've been saying, it ties back into the journey thing. Yeah. And it is, you know, like what's wrong with being a person whose fingers aren't working properly on a harp and like, and being like, wow, my teacher's amazing but this is where I am and my fingers don't work <laughs> and then, like, and exploring this place of having your fingers not work. Like you will literally never be in a place where your fingers work like they do today again. Yeah. Because after today's practice, you're going to be better. So why not like fully dive into experiencing your body being where it is with this information and being in this relationship that you are with the music and the heart where it's all nebulous right now. One day it's going to be in your body and you'll be like, oh, I don't even remember what it's like to be a beginner. Yeah. So Also, uh, that, like, as you were talking about sitting with that, there's that, that speed thing, too, that society says you should already know it. And so somehow there is no value to sitting here doing the same damn scale for literally half an hour because I'm trying to get my fingers to do it right. It isn't that I don't know what the notes are yes he's had to listen to the same eight notes <laughs> literally for half an hour it's because i'm trying to get my fingers to do it right and that and that and to feel that discomfort in the back somewhere saying this time is not well spent because you played those eight notes already <laughs> and and to just be comfortable doing the same eight notes and to not project that he's upset because he's still listening to this darn thing and to not project that if anybody were to see me they would think that I'm not using my time wisely or that why don't I know it yet or that like to, to all these things that we say to ourselves when really it is look today this is this is where my fingers are and this is how long it took me to get there and it took 72 hours of these eight notes or whatever you know yeah but it, it seems to come with like, um, there's an aspect of not actually being being fully attentive to what's really happening here. Because yeah. you're not in fact playing the same eight notes over and over again. You're playing the same strings, but you're playing them a little bit differently, right? So like ancient philosopher Heraclitus says, you never step in the same river twice, right? You never play the same eight notes twice, right? You've, everything <laughs> is, is new and it's and it's different each time, but you have to be in a particular frame of mind to experience it that way. And I think wonderment is actually a really great word for it. Yeah. Um, and I, I love the way you title your program, The Wonder Sessions, because, again, ancient philosopher, right? Socrates, <laughs> maybe Aristotle um, said philosophy begins in wonder. And I think that really applies to a lot of pursuits. You know, I think herbalism begins in wonder uh, and past the point of like, oh, herbs can heal you. That might be something useful to learn. But like, wow, look at this sage plant when I lay down in the garden and put my face under here like this and stare at it up at the sun up through the leaves and I see this like shape of the veins in the thing, that's amazing. And I think that that's really important to what Sage does. Yeah. Right? yeah. So that's, that's wonder. And wonder is also, I wonder what will happen if I take Sage this way or give it to that person. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's also a, um, it's the opposite of knowing. And I think yeah. that is 
really important and we all it's like it's another one of those societal things right where we're supposed to have answers you're supposed to have a position on something you're supposed to be able to debate because that's supposed to somehow make us know whether you're going to be a good leader um, <laughs> um sorry but it's true um <laughs> yeah um and like having a position is supposed to be what makes us an adult and you know makes us worthy of having an opinion at the dinner table and i feel like i feel like that's such bullshit um like if you have a solid immutable opinion on something then i feel like you're on your way to dying <laughs> it's like an area that you're blocking yourself off from the flow and the ever-changing nature of life is the river right mm. and when yeah, it's you, like you're creating stagnancy yeah in an area that's exactly it and i feel like you know if you can step into that river and just sort of like lean back in it and be like wow let's see where this goes like that is it's the opposite of being in that traumatized state where you're like i need to know what's going to happen because i'm terrified and it's also this place where life becomes this like beautiful, playful, constantly growing, joyful thing where you can be like, wow, like, what does this plant do? I think we're not supposed to say that as herbalists. What do you do? <laughs> but like, who is this? What's, what's its nature? How does it change based on the day or the season? Like, and not ever having the answers, but just having relationships and relationships that change constantly based on our attention and awareness and the passage of time. And I think it's a, um, it's such an immensely healing place to be. And to get back to what you were saying before about like how to start, mm. how do you start? I think one of the ways that you start is by dispensing with knowing, yeah. you know, when it comes to our bodies, like instead of being like, oh, I have, Let's say, for example, I have a sore wrist. It must be a tendon. And maybe, you know, maybe it's this tendon because it's right here. And it must have happened because of this thing I did yesterday. And there must be inflammation in there right now. And therefore, and then like we extrapolate on that and we make the future predictions based on our, um, our ideas about what's happening under the skin. So we can't see it. Um, but what we do have is sensation. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's such a different thing that happens with your relationship with your body. If you can explore sensation instead of label mm -hmm. um, and, and explore sensation and allow the sensation to sort of express to you what it means. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's rest, sometimes it's ice, sometimes it's heat, sometimes it's movement, sometimes it's to completely forget about it. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I think it's the same with us as well. Like, you know, to explore who we are outside of label and just be like, who are you today? Like, you know, you're Katya and Rin and I've known you for years. And if I haven't seen you in multiple years, <laughs> years that sounds yeah. like a weird phrasing. Um, but like, if I were to show up today, expecting you to both be the people you were five years ago, then that's doing both of you such a disservice. Yeah. And and yet we do that to ourselves all the time. <laughs> all the time. Why, why can't I do what I could do yesterday? Yeah. What's wrong with me? <laughs> we do it to the plants too. I, it's like um, sometimes students don't want to do things they perceive to be repetition. Like, well, I already learned that at another school. And... <laughs> It's that same thing of stagnancy. It's like, oh, so I know that. But every time you enter into relationship with a new entity, whether that is a person or a plant or yourself or a, an ecosystem or anything, you learn something new. And so there may be many reasons not to repeat something because of other, out, like maybe you have limited finances or limited time or like, okay, fine. There's lots of those things. but assuming we had unlimited of everything, then, then basically there's always that invitation to just know nothing, to just, or to be like, well, I've had some relationship with that. 
and like now there's a chance to go deeper even if you heard literally exactly the same words again you're not the same yeah. you're not the same so you're going to re respond to those words differently than you did the first time you heard them and if we could free ourselves up to let that be okay and to not have to or a, a phrasing of a question that happens often is, well, I know that chamomile, blah, 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 but I'll, and I hear that, that phrasing as an herbalist, but lots of, like, you hear it as any kind of teacher or any kind of anything. If you're perceived to be a person with knowledge, somebody who perceives that they have less knowledge will often open their question that way. Because we somehow need to show that, like, don't worry, I know something. And if we could just be free of that and just be allowed to wonder, just be allowed to like wonder without judgment. Like if I could just say, oh, wh what were you just saying about chamomile and not have to be worried that they will think I'm stupid or that they will think I'm not worth telling because I'm not smart enough or because I didn't already know some things or I was like somehow supposed to already know that and I don't. If we all just were free of that and, and we were like children, right? We were allowed to just ask small yes. children who haven't been to school yet and haven't, you know. Why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why doesn't it get frustrating, right? It gets frustrating because you're like, I've reached the end of my ready to hand explanations for why the sky is blue and you're still asking and I don't actually know and I'm getting frustrated about it. Yeah. Right. And also I'm frustrated because my social construct doesn't allow me to be in the place that you're in. My social construct says I have to go to work and I have to make the dinner and I have to clean the house and it is time consuming for me to keep answering why, but I'm not allowed as an adult in this society just sit around and ask why. And frankly, I'm quite frustrated that you're still doing that. <laughs> you, know? you should know about light refraction by now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yes, it's fascinating. Um, it's all like a part of this gentle unweaving of everything that we've learned to do that is actually harmful to us. Yeah. Right on. Well, so you help people do that. And um, we've mentioned your program a bunch of times, but where do, where do folks go to find you and, and how does it work? Is it rolling enrollment or do you start? It is not. I start enrollment in, what date is it? It's, is it March yet? Is it March yet? It's not March. It's almost March. It's almost March. So start enrollment in the second week of March. What we're doing this year is a fun 10-day um, course on self-worth that is a, um, like it's, that everyone is invited to and it's just gonna be a 10-day course exploring how we, um, yeah, perceive our worthiness in the world. And then after that, I will be opening up enrollment. Um, so there is, I have the dates written down, but enrollment opens, I want to say March 17th. Um, That's a Tuesday. Is it? Yep. How do you do that? There's a calendar, right? Oh, over. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's my superpower. <laughs> I was like, wow. Another for 2023. <laughs> we, we, we need to talk more because I need help with this. <laughs> what day is it? What day is it? Sometimes when I'm filling out a form, and it'll be like, you know, you have to sign and then date it, and I'll be like, and then someone will look over and go, it's the seventh, and I'm like, of? <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll tell me the month, and sometimes, depending on where I am mentally, I'll be like, year? Year? <laughs> um, I mean, like, for two years, I thought I was 38, so, and I just turned Actually, I can't remember anymore. Anyway, like this is, is not a forte of mine. So it's, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> There's like that, that scene in um, the BBC Sherlock at the beginning where Sherlock, like Watson says, you didn't know that the earth goes around the sun. And Sherlock was like, I only have room for important, like for actually relevant information in here. That's how I feel. <laughs> I work for myself. So I only have room for important 
and relevant information and the date is not one of them. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, at any rate. At any rate, yes. Yeah. March 17th, um, enrollment opens and it is a two-year course that is about those relationships that we've been discussing basically it's which makes it really hard to describe because i'm like it's all under surface stuff so like you know you notice your life's changing you notice your perception about yourself and the world around you and your place in it is changing um but hopefully you're not going to be like and that's because of rebecca <laughs> <laughs> that would suck to have put all this work into it to have to feel like I have anything to do with someone else's journey. Um, <laughs> but yes, March 17th. And you can find out more about it at wonderbotanica.com, which is my website. So if you go to my website, wonderbotanica.com, and there's a button at the top that says connect. And there you can sign up for my mailing list. Which, which is awesome. It is awesome. Just, <laughs> just plug my newsletter for a second. I send out a usually every week newsletter and it's so good it's it really is so good it really is so good <laughs> i put so much work into it and it's a ton of free content and i'll discuss like a various topic like the one that's going out tomorrow is on the immune system and it's like just a bunch of information and if you liked any of my rambling thoughts in this podcast then you will like my rambling thoughts in my newsletter because it's all about the same kind of thing. <laughs> if you did not like my rambling thoughts, do not sign up for my newsletter. You will hate it. Um, so yeah, sign up for my newsletter and that's the best place. That's where I will be releasing or announcing the 10 day course that is completely free that you can sign up for. And, um, and then that's the best place to know when I open up my course, The Wonder Sessions as well. Awesome. Nice. Well, we have students who are in your current Wonder Sessions groups, and seriously, they love it, but also we see the difference in their herbal practice. Mm -hmm. Like, we see the impact of the work that they're doing with you in building that self-awareness and building that ability to be comfortable with themselves and to take back agency and to take their own power in situations. <sighs> we see that come through in the way that they are practicing with the plants. So yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. That just made my heart like, hey, so <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, thank, so you. thank you for being out there doing that. And yes. thank you for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's so lovely to have a really deep and intense conversation with you both and just to see you both after so long. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's it's more fun than writing emails. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that we've been writing emails, but it's more fun to do it this way. Yeah. So much more fun. <laughs> Great. Cool. Well, um, so actually, we had other topics that we wanted to talk about that we didn't quite get to. Uh, <laughs> so I think we will do this again, if it's cool with you. I would love that so much. Yeah. This time we'll actually get to the bullet points that we have there you go. Yeah. <laughs> intense instead of being like, but let's go over here instead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Cool. But until then, we will say. Uh, Thanks for listening to the Holistic Herbalism podcast. We'll have another episode for you next week. Until then, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Drink, drink some, some tea. tea. And uh, we'll see you next week. Find some wonder in the world. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank Bye. you so much as well.